Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ara Najarian. Uh, I'm a city council member. I am the chair of the uh, annual commemorative events program for the city of Glendale. I am so happy to see so many concerned uh, art lovers and supporters of Man's Inhumanity to Man and our annual commemorative events here today. This is a unique event. It's a collection of art pieces that all deal with probably the darkest chapter of human history. I'd like to say it's a chapter that is closed, but unfortunately I think we, we all have to agree that it is not closed. It's a chapter that's continuing to be written. And it's only through recognizing and reading pages out of the chapter of that dark history that it's our hope that mankind will realize what tragedies we can bestow on mankind, man's inhumanity to man. I'm very happy that this exhibition exists because it really, it's not about the Armenian genocide, it's not about the Holocaust, it's not about Darfur, it's not about Cambodia, it's about all of them. They are all equally inhumane and they're all, they're all atrocities. And, and really it's through exhibitions like this where all of you can come and and see what's happening and how artists and how people feel about these kinds of events. This is a work of about two months of very hard work of all the committee members and uh, they were introduced to you and I'm so glad, I'm so honored to be able to chair this group of incredibly hardworking, talented and qualified individuals who made this happen. And just a little bit of background about how the exhibition how the works were selected. We sent out a call for artists and they had about a couple of weeks to respond. We received um, over 80 artists, about 400 works of art to choose from. What you see here are 44 artists, about 70, 75 works of art. Now, um, one of the tasks of an art historian is we look at the art, we look at the themes that emerge from it, we think about the story that's told from the works of art. So I don't come to it with a prescription, I don't look for things, I let the art tell me things. I, I try to engage it as actively as I can, and I have to step back and come back to it several times. Um, and the most exciting part actually is when I see you interact with it, which is such a big goal of the exhibition here, is to see how you will respond, what you will say, what you will think. And to do that, we've given you a wall down the hall, the bulletin board, where we ask you to share your thoughts with us, because that will have a life longer than just today when other visitors come to the show. Um, and so what happened with this, we've titled it Man's Inhumanity to Man, Journey Out of Darkness. And um, what we saw emerging when I was looking at the works is the first component which I've titled Faces of Inhumanity. You see the various atrocities, the forms of inhumanity, the faces that have been impacted, the various moments of these in inhumane acts. And on the other side, we transition to the scars of inhumanity. And this is where you see the aftershock, the after effects of what has happened on this side. How have they dealt with this? Not just the victims of the atrocities, but the witnesses, the generations to come, the children of the children have certainly been impacted. So here you'll see survivors telling their stories. You'll see prayer as a mechanism to transcend that grief. Uh, you'll see fragmentation all over with identities and bodies. And then the third component. And this component is a little small, but I think it's very powerful and it's very mighty. And we've titled it Humanity's Triumph. So even though Councilman Ajayan said that the, um, the chapter is not closed, I want to challenge all of us to try to close that chapter. We can do that, not, not our children. We can leave a better, a new chapter for our children. Um, and that's what we want to end the, end the gallery with, is humanity's triumph, the peace, the hope, the survival. You'll see music, re and music composed, words rewritten, stories told, um, and even forgiveness. You'll even find forgiveness there, which I think is another important component to all of this. Uh, we'd like to invite you to engage the works, to come to the other events and really activate uh, your minds because I think that's where the power of art is. It's really to engage you and to bring an emotional response and I think many of you will feel angry, upset, hurt, hopeful, uh, but also an intellectual response in terms of what happens now, what do we do now. So I invite you to enjoy the show. Thank you.
This is a painting called 1947. It was done in 2002 as part of a body of work that really involves imagery from that post-war period when Jewish refugees from World War II, people who had survived the Holocaust, were trying to make their way to Palestine. And uh, of course, the British were running a blockade. About 90 ships tried to run that blockade. Only about four got through. This is the most famous of the ships. It's the Exodus. And uh, it's, a, it's a story of considerable courage and hope and some despair. Um, not everybody uh, in this struggle survives. Some people are killed. They, they, there's a forced evacuation of the ship. And this image is that incident, but it's also a kind of a, a memory image and one that I hope invites the viewer to imagine uh, this kind of um, incident that keeps repeating through history, uh, different people, sometimes Jews, sometimes Armenians, sometimes others. So um, it is meant both to be about a specific moment in history, but also to be um, more about the theme of the show, which is man's inhumanity to man. Myself and my uh, friend Levon Parian have done uh, this piece about uh, the aftermath, really, of the Armenian Genocide. After survivors survive and uh, they come back and they're trying to raise families again, what do they do? They tell stories. And our work is about photographs of them, uh, of their faces, of their eyes, of their hands that tell their story, also about their stories of what happened to them in the genocide. And so they are really the carriers of the memory of the, of the aftermath of this catastrophe. And they're the ones who pass it on generation to generation and it remains sort of in the, let's say, the national consciousness of a people, of the people who have been traumatized by such events through these stories. I was very fortunate I received an invitation from the city of Glendale to participate in this wonderful, wonderful show uh, from my, my sculptures, The Witnesses of War, which I created uh, during the first Gulf War. And I just feel so honored that my sculptures are very meaningful to the purpose of this show, which is about man's inhumanity to man. And I just feel that in having created these uh, during a time of, of struggle and the struggle for peace, that my pieces are representing such such a struggle that it's most fitting to be here with all of the art other art uh, from Glendale and all the surrounding communities. So I really appreciate what the city of Glendale has done to invite me to be a part of this show. This is my work. The title is The Affirmation of Life. It represents the indomitable spirit of those who have suffered injustices by per perpetrators. Uh, from, from the ashes and from the bone, we, through our fate, we take new life. And, and that process is, comes from forgiveness, the spirit of forgiveness, that we are able to forgive ourselves, not to um, uh, retain grudge, anger, hate, 
but to free ourselves from these feelings so that we, ha we have a chance of getting a new life. I was born in Beirut, and we left, my family and I left uh, because of the civil war there. So this is dedicated to Beirut. Beirut Blues. Remember the curtains, mother? How they wrapped their arms around the sofa on windy days? How the blue-tongued ocean below our window licked the painted toes of French tourists in bikinis? Remember tea parties on the balcony? The red dress you sewed for me, right out of the latest issue of Burda magazine? And then the missiles cry. How its whiny trajectory fooled us as it lit up the summer sky during rooftop dinners. They weren't for us, were they? But that day we hid behind the sofa, you and I. They were for us that day, the day we ran down the stairs to the damp and dim below, down where death could not reach and the breath of life was quick at our feet. I remember more, but let's talk instead about the dancing curtains, the wide-mouthed sea, porcelain teacups, and father coming home. The Empty Place of Eddie. I wrote it for Eddie a classmate of my son, Azad, who was uh, ganged down, who was gone down in a gang dispute in Santa Monica in 1996. The Empty Place of Eddie. Today, the rain washes your blood and wipes it from the pavement. There remains only your sunny smile, your tall baseball bat leaning against the wall, and your backpack full of books waiting for your shoulders. Curse the hand that made the gun. Curse the hand that put it in the shop. And curse the hand that pulled the trigger. I am cold and empty, like the shell of a bullet, because I know that your mother will not pass another school again, and will not sit on bleachers in another baseball game, and will not open her empty oven to heat fragrant tortillas for your dinner. Thank you.
I tried to write a poem that discusses the word war and its significance. Um, this is called Words of War. Listen closely. There are letters, puffs of sound strung together to make a word, war. Body so small, threat as big as stain spreading. Beirut burns holes in war story, cries fraud. Yes, it was much worse. Aftermath is suffocating, drowning, falling, catching fire, losing hope. The city is full of promises spilled over dirt-absorbing words. Listen to metallic click, loud bang, popping ears, missile hiss, and pull back your fear. This city ruined our lives. Collapsed home, dropped debris, sky opened and roared war. We smelled its iron. Listen closely. This word, war, Weapon, winning, weight of it, chained us to the city's hate. First, puffs of sound. Then, words rolled. A war nobody entered. This is um, about uh, suicide bombing in Jerusalem. Um, in the Jewish faith, it when a body needs to be whole to be buried. That's the only thing you need to know about this. Jerusalem, August 10th, 2001. Rabbis rush out into blood-splashed streets in white gloves, picking up pieces from the sidewalks and dusty hoods of dented cars. A hand, a toe, a nose, for to rest in peace, one must be buried whole. A child, her tears thinning the blood on her cheeks, stumbles over bodies, calling out to her mother. And when she finds her, she cannot fathom why her mother will not rise, take her hand and lead her away. A man bleeds from a gap between his legs as he begs for help from a soldier was really just a boy in uniform. The boy throws down his gun, vomits, not just the breakfast the mother, his mother made him that morning. Will the rabbis see this and rush over, pick up with their white gloves, the tenderness of this boy splashed on the sidewalk and put it back inside him so he can be whole again? Kind of some problem. I want, I want to see your reactions. You kind of turn around and now you're standing in front of this installation. Yeah. And just remember. There's a lot of violent death images that you see. Now with these heads, how are they going to display? I love this. That's, well, first of all, it's an arrow. Okay. It, it's heads, it draws me in, but at the same time, it prevents me from getting close. This is kind of a victorious end to the perpetrator's action. At the same time, points to the fact that it's very organized, premeditated. So the, the, so the idea that all these things just happen as a kind of chance war event um, is really refuted by works like this. Destruction of culture is often part of a genocidal process. Not only are people killed uh, and regular property destroyed or stolen, but also um, in some genocides, the uh, remnants, the uh, artistic cultural uh, remnants of the people who were destroyed is also uh, often destroyed. In the case of the Armenian Genocide, uh, a huge destruction took place of uh, churches, monasteries, uh, libraries, and this kind of destruction is also a crime against humanity. It's an artistic crime against humanity on top of the bloody crime against humanity. Just like different um, peoples of the world, each people, each civilization adds something to the richness, to the, uh, to the wealth of humanity. So when a culture is destroyed, it's like uh, uh, tearing out a page out of an encyclopedia or taking out pages out of an encyclopedia, the pages you don't want, 
And indeed, it is a crime against humanity of a different sort and a crime that has a more long-term more long-term impact uh, because um, uh, human civilization is diminished because things that cannot be replaced have been eliminated. During the Vanze Conference in January 20th, 1942, in which the Nazi leadership discussed the eradication of U U European Jewry, it was said that during the discussion of what was to be called the final solution, Reinhard Heydrich, head of the Gestapo and second in command of the SS, was asked, would not the world react in horror in such an act of genocide? And he is, and he is said to have replied, who remembers the Armenians? What has always struck me about that remark was his unflinching belief that the world wouldn't care if millions of people were destroyed. The cold and calculating response left me with a sense of personal dread to be living in a world in which human life was nothing more than a means to a political end. I wondered how could people be so callous and cold towards one another, my young mind searched for an explanation um, that seemed to me unexplainable. Since then, I learned more about Cambodia, Rwanda and the Darfurian genocides, the eradication of the, American, uh, uh, of the Native Americans, as well as the destruction of millions of Africans during the Middle Passage and slavery. I then resolved myself to do what I could to not only bring these atrocities to light, but to bring forth a new understanding of ourselves in which such inhumanity to man would be seen as not only the antithesis of our sense of humanity, but also a point from which we could build a new sense of our collective humanity in which such atrocities would, uh, would be seen by all as our own. This is an extraordinary exhibition. I was here two weeks ago, and I was astounded at the number of people who came here. I thought there would be 100, maybe 150. There must have been 1,000 people here. And it was of profound value in generating extraordinary historical consciousness. The issues raised in this exhibition, Man's Inhumanity to Man, are issues that I've tried to deal with for the 40 years that I've taught at the University of California. These issues have infused my teaching for all of those decades. I tried to show how art has been particularly valuable in generating understanding of society, of politics, and above all, of historical understanding. And this exhibition uh, is so remarkable in showing how art can generate historical consciousness. Above all, the value of historical memory, so desperately important uh, at this time in human history. Well, pe people like denial, because denial means that they don't have to take responsibility for what happened in the past. And we use a sense of denial as in the eradication of the Native Americans, where we try to pretend that these instances never occurred. And it bothers me that somehow, thinking that somehow something didn't occur, we then believe that was the case. If we try to convince ourselves, because of one reason or another, maybe it makes us feel uncomfortable about things, that things are not what they were. As, as Professor Bloom was talking about, uh, Jim Crow laws, um, um, uh, the, the, the problems that we have in our country at all, where we act like they never existed, and somehow, therefore, we don't have to think about it. I think that does a detriment to us and to the future. In terms of consequences of, of admitting a genocide, uh, well, uh, uh, there should be a consequence. What that is can be defined in different ways, but the Turkish government knows that one cannot admit to a genocide and just walk away uh, say, I'm sorry. Uh, the U.S. government has um, apologized to uh, Japanese Americans for internment during uh, World War II. Uh, uh, Germany admitted the Holocaust and paid reparations. Uh, so um, uh, that is a fear, but, but uh, it's called justice. And ultimately, my feeling is 
uh, Turkey loses more through the denial than they would lose if there was some, uh, some kind of uh, compensation. The denial itself is, uh, has, uh, is eroding Turkish identity. It's like a cancer. And many Turks, Turkish officials, not Turkish officials, Turkish scholars are speaking about this, that Turkish identity and the, and the level of democracy in Turkey is being damaged by the denial of the genocide. So admitting to it, I think, would benefit uh, Turkey in the long run overall. When we talk about the Armenian genocide and Armenian music, one name immediately comes to mind, and that name is Gomidas. In today's program, I will uh, focus on the music and life of Gomidas, and through which I would like to make some illustrations about the genocide, uh, Gomidas and his music, and eventually uh, his influence on Armenian arts and culture. The importance of Gomidas and his musical output, which occurred before the genocide, is articulated brilliantly by pianist Serush Karadjian in his liner notes of the Gomidas Songs album, which he recorded with his wife soprano Isabel Bayraktarian. I quote, Gomidas purified Armenian music of all foreign influences and gave it back to its people, laying the foundations of a national musical culture. This explains his rightful recognition as father of Armenian classical music, one shudders to imagine what might have happened had Gomidas not begun his mission well before 1915. After the genocide, nothing survived. Churches were destroyed, pilgrimages and all the ceremonies accompanying them came to an end, and villagers clinging to their land and singing its praises were killed or deported. Nothing was left to compile or compare, let alone preserve for future generations. Gomidas came forward at the 11th hour to redeem a vital characteristic of a 4,000-year-old civilization that was eventually uprooted from its cradle. art historian this is a dream to come um, to come to this kind of a project where you can look at the work of artists uh, study them uh, feel all kinds of emotions while you're looking at them and then make a selection out of that and then try to tell a story with the art um, and it's important for me because I think the topic is so important it's very um, it's at the core of I think all of us uh, our reality in our everyday lives with this man's inhumanity to man and I think just my um, you know, my heart and soul being involved in trying to change that history. I have two little girls and I have a commitment to them. Uh, I teach, I have a commitment to my students to try to give them and leave them something that better than what I have seen or what my grandparents have seen. Um, so because of that, it's just a, it's a, it gives me the spur of energy to approach and tackle a project of this magnitude.